Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our webinar, How Peer-to-Peer -peer Electric Vehicle Charging Works and Why It Has So Much Potential, uh, presented by EV Match. My name is William Truesdell, and I'll be your MC for today. I work here at EV Match. We're going to give folks just a couple of minutes to join. Um, in the meantime, we have a poll question that you can answer there at the bottom of your screen um, about your interest in sharing a personal charger for the peer-to-peer -peer network. So we'll just give folks a couple minutes, so hang tight. You can also ask questions um, at the bottom, at the ask a question button, or you can uh, type anything into the chat to have a conversation with folks. Um, but if you could try to put your questions in the ask a question box, that would be very helpful so that we can organize those for the Q&A session at the end. All right, I'll be back in just a couple minutes while we let a few more people join. Thanks. If you have just recently joined, um, we're just giving folks a couple more minutes uh, to get ready. So probably in the next minute or so, I'm gonna get started. Um, but if you did just join and you didn't hear my original introduction, um, I'll, I'll give it again. So again, thanks for joining our webinar, How to how Peer to Peer Electric Vehicle Charging Works and Why It Has So Much Potential, presented by EV Match. My name is William Truesdell. I'm gonna MC today um, and I work here at EV Match. Um, there is a poll question that you can answer in the meantime before we get started about your interest in sharing a charger as a host on a peer-to-peer -peer network. So if you want to answer that, and then if you have any questions, um, please enter them into the ask a question box so that we can uh, organize those for the Q&A session at the end. All right. We're gonna get started. Um, so just a few announcements up front. All of you are muted as attendees. So if you wanna ask a question, do so in that ask a question box and you'll type it in. Um, we'll have a Q&A session at the very end of the presentation and we'll also have a number of helpful resources at the end of the presentation. Um, and if you, uh, you know, join late um, or you want to reference anything from the presentation, you're in luck because we're gonna email this out to you uh, in the coming days. All right, so here's the agenda for today. Um, in this webinar, we're gonna cover the ins and outs of peer-to-peer -peer charging, and we're gonna highlight why it has so much potential. 
Um, so we're excited to be joined by Vanessa Perkins with Community Charging. Uh, Vanessa will highlight the value of peer-to-peer -peer charging in dense urban cities like Chicago, where her organization focuses their work. And then at the end, again, we'll do some Q&A. So get your questions in as we move along. So my name, again, is William Truesdell. I do sales and marketing here at EV Match. Um, I'm, I've worked in the EV industry for over two years. And before that, I worked with elected officials at the Colorado State Legislature. Um, so now I'm going to pass it off to Vanessa so she can introduce herself. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Vanessa. I live in Chicago. Um, I've been there the last three years working in the commercial industrial energy efficiency sector with the utility programs. Um, I was a environmental entrepreneurs fellow from 2018 to 2019, conducting research on peer to peer charging for urban res residential neighborhoods in Chicago. And as a result, I'm launching a nonprofit to help support uh, community charging in urban residential neighborhoods that will enable residents to help charge their communities. I'm also a used Nissan Leaf driver who lives in a um, multifamily building with street parking. <laughs> And now I'll uh, head it over to Heather. Thanks, Vanessa. Hi, everyone. My name is Heather Hochrein, and I'm the founder and CEO of EV Match. And it's great to be here today on our second webinar. Thank you for joining us. So I started EV Match back in 2016 as an innovative solution to address the growing need for EV charging. I bring expertise in the clean energy, energy efficiency, and transportation electrification sectors. And I previously directed energy efficiency and workforce training programs at Rising Sun Center for Opportunity, which is based in Berkeley, California. I'm very passionate about accelerating the adoption of cleaner electric vehicles. And I actually started EV Match out of my graduate research project at UC Santa Barbara. So with that, I'm gonna dive right in. And we're really looking forward to sharing um, some great information about our service and ways that you can get involved. Uh, next slide. Alrighty. So as many of you may know, transportation is the single largest contributor to carbon pollution in the United States and a major cause of local air pollution. Luckily, the era of electric vehicles has arrived. Electric vehicles have zero tailpipe emissions and lower greenhouse gas emissions compared to gasoline vehicles. Next slide. And we know that this is a rapidly growing market. So we expect 125 million electric cars to be on the road worldwide by 2030. And even amid low gas prices and these uncertain times with COVID-19, electric cars are growing in popularity. 40 million Americans are considering buying an electric vehicle for their next car. And EVs are going to be a huge part of stimulus packages around the world. Next slide. However, the biggest challenge for the EV industry is charging infrastructure. And limited EV charging causes drivers stress and frustration. And this is especially problematic for renters and apartment dwellers who are less likely to have home charging access. So in order to drive the mass adoption of these cleaner electric vehicles, we need public charging that's affordable, convenient, and reservable in advance. And so that's where EV Match comes in. Our app-based service leverages the sharing economy, very similar to Airbnb or Lyft, to increase access to reliable charging. So with the EV Match app, homeowners, businesses, and other property managers can rent out their private EV charging stations. So we're making charging easier and more reliable so anyone, regardless of where they live, can comfortably drive an electric vehicle. So here's how it works. Charging hosts simply list their home or business charging station on EV Match, either evmatch.com or through one of our mobile apps in either, the, either of the app stores. So the charging host will input their station details, including the charger location, availability hours, access, and price. And for residential hosts, they also input their electric utility provider and the name of their rate structure so that we can accurately price their charging sessions. So this is especially helpful for folks who may not know how much they pay for electricity and want an easy pricing tool. So
So EV drivers then find a charging station on the map that meets their needs. They can filter for details such as plug type, power output, availability, and price. They can then reserve and pay for a station with a few quick clicks. So by offering reservations and payment processing, EV drivers know exactly where and when they'll charge before they even leave their home. Next slide. And so what's very exciting about this idea of peer-to-peer -peer charging is that we can rapidly increase the amount of public EV charging infrastructure with very limited um, costs. So any home or business can serve as a fueling station. And that's a really exciting idea. So our solution actually creates 20 times more public charging by bringing these private charging stations that are underutilized and making them available and accessible to the public. Next slide. So we're excited to dive in now a little bit deeper into what it looks like to be a host on EV Match, or for some of those who are hosts on our platform today to share a bit more about how you can increase the number of drivers at your charging stations. So I'm gonna pass it over to William Truesdell to lead the next section. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Heather. Um, all right, so now let's take a close, closer look at how hosting a charger works on a peer-to-peer -peer network. So as you can see on this slide, EV Match has charging hosts all over the country that signed up and created a listing for the public to use. So let's first take a look at the makeup of our peer-to-peer -peer charging network. Heather covered the value that EV drivers receive from EV Match. So I'll cover the other two categories, residential hosts that you see there in the screen in the middle and commercial hosts on the right side. So what are residential hosts? They're homeowners who share their private charging stations or outlets on the EV Mesh platform. And this is you know, to support their communities as well as a way to earn some extra cash. Any outlet or charging station can be listed on our platform. Um, so we are hardware agnostic in that way. Um, and hosts also do have the option of uh, installing a connected charger with um, added security and access control features. And I'll get into the details about what charger that is exactly. All right, so the second type of hosts are commercial hosts. So those are businesses, multifamily buildings, fleet operators, really any sort of public facing location. They have to install a compatible low cost smart charger um, as the one you see here, the juice box. Um, there's a 2.0 version that looks a little different that we'll show in a later slide. The reason that commercial and multifamily hosts install one of these stations is for the access control. So since it's in a public facing place, we have an integration. So only through our software, when you've made a reservation, can you actually unlock the charger so that it gives you electricity. Otherwise it won't give electricity so that folks can't steal um, any electricity from a commercial hosts. Commercial hosts um, also can take advantage of the reservations, the access control, the payment processing, and a user group management feature so that you can provide differentiated pricing and availability for different user groups. Um, an easy example there are tenants in a multifamily building. So let's say you live in an apartment, um, you would like your building to add charging, but they only wanna provide charging um, in a shared manner among the tenants. Um, we enable this through our software with the access control features. Um, and finally, the last thing to note about commercial hosts is this is an opportunity to save 30 to 60% on installing level two charging compared to other solutions available on the market today. All right, so you might be asking yourself, you know, why should I be a host? What's in it for me? And we've surveyed our current residential hosts to bring you some of their top reasons. Um, so with in-app payment processing, as I mentioned, hosts are assured to recoup electricity costs with the option of also making a profit so they can mark it up a little bit. In addition to earning money, our hosts value the support they get to provide to their own community. So by sharing a charger, a host helps more people drive electric, in turn reducing carbon emissions and air pollution locally. Our hosts also know that they, um, they only use their chargers some of the time, right? About 30% of the time. It sits idle that other 70% of the time. So this is an opportunity to increase the public charging as a collective 
so that that shortage that we're facing um, is no longer there. And this will help more people drive electric. Um, we make it very easy to host because you get to set your own price and your own availability schedule. So for example, you can choose to share it 24 seven um, or when only when you're at home, because that's when you're most comfortable sharing it. Our commercial hosts are motivated by many of these same reasons um, as the residential hosts, but they have even more financial incentive to add charging and leverage our software to share the stations. Um, so what's that incentive look like? Commercial hosts can earn a profit of $1,500 per station per year. Plus, they have the ability to restrict access to those different groups, as I mentioned. So if they don't want to open it up to the larger public, they can keep it um, restricted to just tenants of an apartment building or maybe just employees at a workplace. Um, the sky's the limit, and it's very customizable there. All right, so some of you tuning in uh, may already be EV Match hosts. Um, and some of you might be considering it. Um, so we wanna offer a few best practices to improve your experience. So the number one best practice um, is to share your EV match listing um, on other platforms to increase exposure. So you can list it on PlugShare. I'm sure most of you are familiar with that platform um, that aggregates all public charging, um, as well as the Department of Energy uh, Alternative Fuels Locator so on both of these, you can create a listing of your EV match listing so that more people will be exposed to it and will more likely use your station to make more money. You can also share your listings anywhere there might be interest, right? So one great option is on Facebook EV groups. I can't tell you how many of these there are. It's there are at least one or two, maybe three for every EV model out there. Um, so I highly recommend checking it out. Um, they're very engaging. People post and discuss in them all the time. Um, and we also notice that people are asking questions about you know, where to find charging. Um, maybe they're a prospective EV driver and they don't know how charging works or they don't know where to find public charging. Um, so this is an opportunity where you can also advertise your EV match listing to help other folks find it. All right, so um, what's the easiest way to share your EV match listing? Uh, we've built into the platform uh, a way so that you have your own unique URL that you can share around easily. And you can get there by logging into your account, clicking on my listings, um, and then choosing the listing that you wanna share, clicking that view as public orange button that you see there in the middle of this slide. And that'll take you to the screen on the right um, and you can pull that unique link right out of the um, right out of the toolbar, and then you can share that wherever you're cross-listing your station, whether it's on PlugShare, um, the Alternative Fuels Locator, um, or like we discussed, other places like Facebook groups. All right, so best practice number two: um, enable instant booking. This will increase the number of charging sessions um, that occur at your charger. And that's really just because we've seen EV drivers desire that instant access to stations for a seamless experience. So if you're not sure if instant booking is enabled currently on your listing, um, you can check it in the availability tab of your listing and you can easily toggle it on um, and don't forget to click save. So this, this shot on this slide um, shows the lightning bolt at the bottom that instant booking is enabled. All right, um, best practice number three, and we discussed this a little bit earlier on, but installing a connected charger, specifically the NLX juice box. Um, so this uh, level two charger is a leading charger for both residential and commercial installs. And we have a software integration with the juice box. Um, so hosts can enjoy wireless access control features. Um, so this means that only drivers that EV match reservation can unlock the station, as I mentioned before. So it adds that extra security. Additionally, the juice box provides data reporting functions so you can track your charger's electricity usage, um, which is a must have for many of our customers. All right, so I'm sure some of you are wondering um, what is a good lo location to host? Um, so the short answer is that any location has the potential to serve an EV driver in need, 
Um, but with that in mind, uh, we wanted to take a look at some of the best residential hosting locations. Um, so the first one is near a multi-unit dwelling, like an apartment or a condo, um, especially if that apartment or condo doesn't have dedicated charging installed. Folks that live in that apartment will be looking for a place to charge nearby. If you share your home charger, um, that could be a very convenient place for them to do so. Number two, um, you know, this kind of goes without saying, but near public areas. So where people to spend to tend to spend an hour or more. Um, this could include near downtowns, malls, um, and hiking trails. That's just to name a few. Um, the third location is near workplaces. So, you know, many workers have significant commutes or don't have an easy way to charge at home, as we discussed. So if they're going to drive electric, they need charging near a location where they spend a lot of time. And work is one of those places. All right, so that was the residential side of things. Now let's look at some use cases for commercial hosting. As we mentioned, any type of business or commercial location can install and rent their station with EV Match. And here are a few of the most ideal locations. Um, so we've mentioned apartment buildings, HOAs and condos, um, co-working offices. We have some hosts because it makes sense there are many different workers coming from all over and sharing that station is a very useful um, amenity to provide. Um, places of worship like churches, um, that's a place, you know, there typically tends to be a parking lot that can be accessible um, to the public and also can be used by the, um, the worshipers or the parishioners. A workplace, as I mentioned, um, you know, if you're a residential host near a workplace, that's excellent as well. But if you're also um, an employer and you install charging, that can be very helpful for your employees. And then parking garages, um, you know, that, that's kind of a no brainer, public parking garages that people spend significant amounts of time in um, is a great opportunity. So many of these have chosen EV Match because our solution offers affordable hardware. So it's a connected NLX juice box that um, for commercial location, locations starts around $300 per station. And we also offer the lowest cost software package with reservations, secure payment processing, and that grouping feature. So all, all of those bells and whistles that we've mentioned before. And overall, this package is 30, 30 to 60% cheaper than other options on the market. So it's a great opportunity. All right, so now let's take a closer look at what type of EV drivers benefit the most from the peer-to-peer -peer network. So first and foremost, the power of a peer-to-peer -peer network is that anyone with an EV can use it, right? So it's not a proprietary network. It's um, a platform that anyone can download. It's free to download, um, so it's accessible to everyone. Um, but with that in mind, here are some of the best use cases. So we've mentioned this over and over, renters and multifamily tenants without home charging. Um, you know, that's more than 40% of the country, of the United States. Um, so it's a significant segment of folks that we want to drive electric, but right now don't have the infrastructure to do so. So the peer-to-peer -peer network is a low cost way to provide that right away. Airbnb guests uh, is another great segment. So this includes both people that drive their own EV to a vacation destination and they're gonna need to charge while they're there. Or maybe you um, fly to a destination and you rent um, an EV using a service like Turo um, and you need to charge your destination. In either case, Airbnb hosts um, oftentimes are also EV match hosts so that they can recoup the electricity costs from their guests using their chargers. Um, again, road trippers uh, in the same vein as Airbnb guests, oftentimes um, an EV match host is hosting in maybe a more remote area that you can't find typical public charging. So it's a great option to fill in the gaps. And then long commuters, as I mentioned, if you drive a significant distance for work, um, and you need to charge before you head back home at the end of the day, um, they can really benefit from a peer-to-peer -peer network. All right, so um, another great thing about the peer-to-peer -peer model is that we're perfectly aligned to partner with utilities and local governments, and they're starting to notice the value of peer-to-peer -peer charging. 
Um, so through one such partnership, they can scale public charging faster and at a lower cost than if they invested capital financing their own network of chargers. We're currently engaged in pilots with uh, a, couple, a few utilities, Green Mountain Power and Burlington Electric Department are both in Vermont and Silicon Valley Clean Energy in California. And the idea there is to increase shared EV charging, mainly at multi-unit dwellings, but also at commercial locations. Um, and the result is that more charging locations are accessible to more people. Um, and that comes at a lower cost to the utilities and the public sector. And that's just one of the ways um, that the peer-to-peer -peer network can be so powerful. We also have a number of new partners. Um, and as a peer-to-peer -peer network, we're able to form lasting partnerships to expand EV charging access for everyone. So some of the, these newest partnerships include Charlie Charging. They're a full service EV charging company that offers a subscription-based service to operate and maintain your stations. So it's a great hassle-free option if you want to install charging, but don't want to deal with the ongoing operation and maintenance, check out Charlie Charging. Um, EV Life, if you tuned into our first webinar, we were joined by Peter Glenn, the co-founder of EV Life. Um, and they're a great new website, um, evlife.co, that makes it extremely easy to save um, on, the next per on your purchase of maybe your first or maybe your second or third electric vehicle. Um, they lay out all the incentives available to you and really help you negotiate down to the last um, last time. And we're also partnered with a couple of chapters of the Sierra Club, um, the San Francisco Bay chapter and the Santa Lucia chapter. So if you're interested in partnering with us, let us know. Um, we're always looking for ways to expand the pub the peer to peer network so that um, you know more people can use it. All right, with that, I'd like to pass the mic over to Vanessa. She's gonna share a case study of peer-to-peer -peer charging that she's been spearheading in Chicago. And uh, obviously Chicago is one of the most dense and renter heavy cities in the US. So it's a great use case. All right, take it away, Vanessa. Thanks, William. All right, hi everyone. Um, so I live in Chicago and I am a passionate electric vehicle driver. Um, and I have to have a car for work and I live in a three flat with uh, street parking only. And so when I learned about the peer to peer model as a solution for finding um, charging locally near my house or near my work, I was really excited about it. Um, I ended up completing a fellowship with environmental entrepreneurs to design and research uh, the feasibility um, and uh, potential of peer-to-peer -peer charging in urban residential neighborhoods, um, which like William said, is heavily multifamily and have it heavily um, made up of renters. So let me, um, with that, let me just give you guys a little bit of a snapshot of the EV scene in Chicago specifically. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So when I first approached Chicago and started to try to understand um, why there weren't a lot of electric vehicles around the city um, and why there were more in the suburbs, uh, one thing was, was pretty clear. Um, so take a look at Chicago. This map here shows, uh, this is plug share. This shows where the public chargers are. Keep in mind, Chicago is a very dense city. It's a cold climate um, and uh, Chicago land is actually made up of much more than just that cluster downtown. So Chicago um, basically circles all of this out to Chicago Avenue on the west side, all the way to the lake down to the south there. Um, so what I learned about uh, existing charging infrastructure and existing EV ownership was that First of all, the chargers that you see publicly available are heavily concentrated in wealthier neighborhoods of Chicago or downtown inexpensive parking garages. There are also a lot of Tesla only chargers, which only work for Tesla vehicles. Um, and then further, uh, a lot of you may know this already, but like there's a huge amount of chargers on the north side of Chicago, but a really limited amount of public charging on the west and south side of Chicago. Um, that definitely reflects the disparities in income. Um, so considering that Chicago is 70% multifamily, most of the people rent and don't necessarily have a parking spot, 
and that people do indeed drive cars. Um, a recent study shows that Chicagoans are actually purchasing more and more vehicles and most people do own a car in Chicago and have street parking. Um, it is tricky to make the case for driving electric when you just don't see any charging options in your neighborhood locally or if you work uh, uh, not downtown essentially. Even if you do work downtown, to no one really drives unless they're paying 20 bucks a day for a parking spot or to enter that garage and get the free charging after paying $30 a day. So anyway, this is the existing infrastructure. Um, what I currently do is drive to a Walgreens about two miles from me, hope that the charge point charger is available and plug in when I can. Um, but again, if I could have something that was near my house, um, guaranteed availability when I look to check it, that I could book it, it would make it a lot more easier to drive electric. Um, one more thing I wanna point out that although Chicago is a cold climate, um, it was recently ranked as one of the best cities to drive electric because of the cost savings generated by charging on our low cost electricity. I think overnight charging is down to maybe four cents. Um, and also no one is really driving around Chicago more than 10 miles a day. So the although there is range anxiety and there is a limit in the amount of public infrastructure for charging, um, it's a great place to drive electric. Um, and of course, as many of you know, electric vehicles are on par with the cost of buying a new internal combustion engine. Okay, so that's a snapshot of Chicago. With that, uh, with the E2 Fellowship, what I did over the next year was I researched the feasibility of a peer-to-peer -peer charging network. How could we get more uh, chargers in these urban residential neighborhoods closer to where people live, closer to those multifamily buildings, and really spread out about around Chicago so that you could zip around the city and not have range anxiety. So in researching community chargers, what I mean is a peer-to-peer -peer network of privately owned chargers that could be rented and reserved by local EV drivers. Um, in this sense, and in surveying people, I asked if they would be open to hosting a charger if they could. Um, would they do it for passive income generation with that Airbnb model of uh, the sharing economy, or would they do it um, to market themselves with a green image? Um, most of the survey uh, results that I got actually said that they would want to put up an EV charger to make a statement and encourage green and clean transportation in their community. Um, which I was surprised by. I thought people would see it as a marketing thing more, but it was definitely people were excited about seeing EVs and bringing them to their neighborhoods and participating in the clean transportation revolution that we're all trying to partake in. Um, so just a quick snapshot on the right. These are some of the uh, hosts, uh, potential hosts that I surveyed. Um, I did site assessments at small businesses and urban res Chicago neighborhoods. Uh, restaurants, a lot of houses of worship, which tend to have uh, the existing infrastructure and extra parking, you know, except maybe on Sundays. Um, and so I discovered that there's a lot of infrastructure out there to support putting up peer-to-peer -peer chargers. Um, so these are some of the, it, oh, and also in urban residential neighborhoods, much of the parking is street parking, but a lot of these smaller private sites have their own parking lots, which means it's a really quick and easy case for them to see that they could benefit by putting up a charger. They don't need to go through any red tape with the city. They own the right of way and, and all that. So primarily my, my surveys focused on local, small community organizations, um, businesses, houses of worship. Okay, next slide. So I want to share the results of my surveys um, from 2018 to 19. Um, I did survey, I think, around 40 people in the various neighborhoods in Chicago. Um, I found that although many people were excited about hosting, the investment for the installation was very expensive um, and uh, or other places they would have to go through a series of uh, property management, and it was just a big um, push for them to go through. But there were 10 sites that were like a very clear prime host candidate for a pilot. 
these sites tended to have infrastructure that was in place already that would make an installation less than $5,000 for a commercial level two charger, smart charger. Um, that's really exciting considering that some level two installs are $15,000 or more. Um, so these points on the map were my low cost installs. Um, they were houses of worship, small businesses, um, and I think a few restaurants that really wanted to encourage EVs in their neighborhood. A few of them wanted to attract different types of drivers um, and also wanted to really help uh, help support clean air in their community, um, which I'll touch on in the next slide. Um, so these are the 10 uh, sites plotted on the uh, boundary of the city of Chicago. So now let me show that on an overlay of some of the um, other socioeconomic and environmental uh, factors of Chicago. So next page. So if think of that map that you saw before and now take a look at this one, um, which was published recently by the NRDC. Um, this is a cumulative burden, uh, a cumulative, I can't say, cumulative environmental burden map showing a lot of the um, environmental toxins, uh, ground and air across the city. Remember when I said that the charging stations were concentrated downtown Chicago, which is right on the lake, um, not in that red area in the center, but right on the lake, and how a lot of the public chargers were also concentrated on the north side. Those are also, you know, where tends to be uh, wealthier areas, um, a better air quality compared to the west side, that very red area, and the south side, the um, Calumet industrial area down there. So interestingly, this also shows where the charging infrastructure gaps are as well, and where a lot of the charging infrastructure investments are not being placed. So I was really excited that in serving various communities throughout Chicago, that uh, five of the 10 sites were on the west and the south side and really excited about being the first movers to put up chargers in their neighborhood, because that's also an area where those people could benefit the most from cleaner air and EV adoption. Okay, next slide. So I overlaid the survey, um, those sites that I surveyed with uh, some of the socioeconomic factors as well, just to kind of, um, you know, prove that this could also support tenants. And as you can see on the left, um, I told you before, Chicago is 70% multifamily with the majority being renters. Um, most of these charging stations are concentrated in areas where most of the people are renting. You'll see more um, ownership out in the suburbs. Um, so this would also really support um, people like myself who either there's only one parking spot at their building and they only have street parking or the landlord has uh, lives out in the suburb and is it's difficult to onboard them with putting up a charger, which we've faced a lot of um, right to charge issues in the city of Chicago. So having a community charger in these neighborhoods would be very beneficial to renters that if choosing to purchase a car want to go electric and could charge near their home each night or um, if they have an electric car could use these. Um, so and then on the right, we see the high ozone level map. So the, the dark green areas similar on the left is where it's concentrated ozone levels. Again, the west and the south, west south side is where the worst air pollution is. Um, and part of that is from a legacy of industrial um, manufacturing. And there was even coal power plants in Chicago up to like 10 years ago. Um, but also it's, you know, we have trucking, we have transportation emissions. And once you go inland from the lake, it can get really bad. Um, and I just keep thinking, especially in the time of COVID-19, how lung resiliency and lung health is so critical to preventing infection and fight this disease. You know, EVs also play a role in clean air, which can help society moving forward. Um, so anyway, this was this was surprising that so much of the uh, sites I surveyed were in these high ozone areas. Um, so I let's see, let's go to the next slide now. So as a result of surveying these sites and identifying the 10 low cost installations 
and community partners that would be really exciting, excited and open to hosting a smart level two charger that could be reserved by their community, listed at an affordable price and helping electrify their neighborhood. I just decided to start a local community group um, and a nonprofit to help cover the installation cost of level two chargers so that um, as in exchange for the host to list and publicly utilize their privately owned charger. Um, we have selected our first hosts and the installation will be going in as soon as we are out of our shelter in place order. Um, we are still doing outreach and getting a lot of requests for virtual site assessments and interest in what it's like to host. Um, and also this has attracted um, some of the other local community environmental groups, um, such as solar nonprofits and um, energy efficiency nonprofits and um, even electric vehicle rideshare companies. So within the ecosystem of clean tech and climate advocacy in Chicago, community charging and peer-to-peer -peer charging um, seems to play along really well in sync with efforts for clean energy and clean transportation, as well as equity. Um, by the end of December next year, we're hoping to have our 10 pilot sites up and running, um, listing their chargers and attracting and teaching more and more about electric vehicle usage for the city of Chicago. Um, with that, I will, uh, we have a few resources you guys can check out and um, later on I'll share my uh, email if you guys are interested in learning more about these Chicago uh, specific efforts. Okay, uh, William, I'll hand it back to you. Great, great, thanks Vanessa. That was a great presentation and um, very interesting to see exactly uh, what's going on in Chicago and how this model could be applied there. All right, so uh, that concludes the, the content section of our presentation um, about peer-to-peer -peer charging. I wanted to offer this slide um, that uh, gives you a couple of great resources. On the left side, um, charging related rebates and incentives. So Plug in America has um, a great resource on their website. You can search by state and find all of the EV charging and EV related incentives available to you. So I highly suggest checking that out. Um, again, we'll be sending this presentation out and all of these um, that you see are hyperlinked, so you can click right to them. Um, obviously the federal EV charging tax credit is still available through 2020. So that's up to a thousand, that's up to 30% um, of, a, of a credit, uh, up to a thousand dollars for residential installs and then up to $30,000 for commercial public charging installs. Um, so take a look at that. If you've already installed charging, you may be eligible for this. Um, so talk to your accountant. All right, on the right side, we have some websites and apps linked here. Obviously the EV Match app, as we've uh, discussed, is a great resource. Um, so download that. Um, it's free for both users and hosts. NLX, um, the maker of the juice box, is linked there. Um, they have a, a high-tech um, smart charging station, as we discussed, at a low price point. So it's a great option for both residential and commercial installs. Chicago for EVs, um, check out that resource so you can learn more about Vanessa's uh, project. Um, the Department of Energy Alternative Fuels Locator, um, as we mentioned for a best practice, Cross-listing your EV match listing on their um, on their app is very useful, um, and then you can also use it to locate um, the aggregated public charging. PlugShare uh, does the same thing, so check that out. And ChargeHub is another uh, resource. Um, most or actually all EV match um, listings can be found on there. All right, so our upcoming webinar um, on May twenty sixth, we're going to do a deep dive into um, EV charging at apartments and condos. And then we're gonna look into how to get your HOA or property owner on board with these projects. Um, so make sure you put that on your calendar, um, May 26th, 12 p.m. Pacific time. We will blast about it, um, so you'll, you should be able to find that. 
All right, so now we made it to the Q&A session. Um, we have about 15 minutes left in the hour, so we'll try to get through as many as we can. If you wanna ask a question now, you still can. Um, on your platform, click on the ask a question button there at the bottom and type it in and we will work on getting to all of them. All right, uh, with that, this is our final slide. We're gonna do a little Q&A from here. Um, Heather and Vanessa are going to join. I'm gonna MC and help contribute to the answers where I can. So we're gonna start, um, we're gonna start with this question. How do you address the legality of the reselling of power from specific utilities? So Heather, are you um, online? Can you help us answer this? There we go. Yes, absolutely. Um, so this is a great question and we definitely hear this quite often. What's exciting is that many state governments have actually passed legislation to exclude electric vehicle service providers or uh, network providers um, from being regulated as an electric utility. So that's true in California. It's true in most zero emission vehicle states throughout the country. So that means that EVSE operators are not regulated as utilities and therefore they are not viewed as reselling electricity. Um, so we actually sell time on our platform. So a EV driver books a specific time slot. And so they're paying for access to a parking spot. So even in those states where it's less clear and EVSE operators may be regulated as utilities or it's ambiguous, um, we still are not regulated as a utility because we are not actually selling electricity. We're selling access to a parking spot. Um, for our commercial hosting platform, we do have payment options of hourly or kilowatt hour pricing. Um, and we only have those kilowatt hour pricing options in states where it is allowed by the state. For residential, all of the bookings are done on a per time basis. Um, I'll, oh, sorry. Oh, you want to jump in, Vanessa? Yeah. I just want to jump in too. So um, at least in Illinois, the Illinois Commerce Commission was actually really excited about the um, the peer-to-peer -peer charging because it's considered exactly like you're selling an amenity. You're sell selling hourly charging and parking and a convenience amenity. So. Um, I, that was one of my first questions in my research project, and it is indeed legal and um, favored in Illinois. <laughs> Great. Thanks for that. Um, all right, second question. How does a platform, um, so I think the whoever asked this question was referring to EV Match, survive when others are giving chargers and charging away for free? Um, so, you know, the, and I can answer this a little bit, and then Heather, if you want to jump in, but, um, you know, this trend of free charging, you could sort of compare it to how, um, how the federal government, you know, uses, and the states use incentives to try to influence behavior to, um, for a paradigm shift. So in the same way that, um, you know, there's a, a federal tax credit for charging and for, um, for buying an electric car, those are great to, to get the ball rolling, but um, not really viable long-term. Um, so we see that the trend of offering free charging is phasing out as EV adoption increases. Um, at the end of the day, hosts really do need to recoup electricity costs um, for it to be sustainable um, to, you know, to provide the operation of EV charging. So um, that certainly seems to be the trend um, Heather, do you want to add anything else to that? Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think that there certainly was free charging offered by the Tesla supercharger network um, originally for Model S and X drivers. That's being phased out with Model 3 drivers. What's happening is that station operators and network providers really cannot sustain their ongoing costs, the operation and maintenance costs, if they give away um, electricity and they have to pay for the electricity. So I see that as... Um, you know, it's an early adopter um, way to get folks to drive electric. It's very helpful and cities and governments have offered free charging and continue to do so. But I certainly don't see that um, being a long term sustainable option. Um, and I don't think that that's going to be the way to have this go mainstream. I get really fired up about this question because um, you'll OK, so OK, I'm my Chicago perspective, but what you'll also see, um, just going back to that map of PlugShare that I showed you, 
where many of the existing public chargers are offered for free. Again, it's in commercial districts downtown where you're entering a parking garage for $20, which is much more than the cost of charging your car. Or we're seeing them go up again in wealthier neighborhoods and you really need to have an even distribution across the city. So while the Whole Foods on the north side is getting free chargers, even a Whole Foods on the south side will not have a free charging station. They don't even have an EV charging station. So the peer-to-peer -peer network really helps people take charge of building the infrastructure. It also, again, provides the, like Heather said, provides the incentive to maintain the infrastructure. There are so many chargers in Chicago that were installed as this first wave to get people to see the technology and use the technology that are now no longer functional because there was no, um, when you get there and you're on low battery, you just freak out because uh, PlugShare said it's working and it's not, um, but there's no incentive to maintain the charger. So having the asset owned privately and rented out, or at least having those stakeholders um, continually maintain it is a huge benefit to the sustainability of EV charging and EV growth in, in at least in Chicago. Great, thanks, Vanessa. Um, and then kind of piggybacking on that question, someone wondered what the average monthly fee um, a commercial site would pay to own and operate a charger on its property. Um, so this is also another great thing about the peer-to-peer -peer network is that we can keep the, um, the software fees low. Um, and then if you do wanna you know, go with a company like Charlie Charging to be a full service um, operator and maintainer, you can pay uh, on a monthly fee for that as well. But for the EV match software at commercial locations, it's just $10 a month per charger. Um, so it's very reasonable um, and most small medium and medium sized businesses can afford it. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll also add that we have a nonprofit rate, uh, which is 50% off. So for example, those um, congregations and houses of worship that were mentioned, those would be nonprofits. Um, they can qualify for 50% off. And the other consideration is really just operating the network connectivity. So one benefit of our system is that we connect with local Wi-Fi. So an entity can tap into their existing internet and that way they don't have to pay for additional cellular networking fees. So that helps to keep the operating costs very low. Yeah, great, thank you. All right, so here's a, um, a great question kind of getting into the the nuts and bolts of how a peer-to-peer -peer network would work. Um, someone asks, how do you mitigate security issues at your home with strangers using an EV charger? Um, so Heather, do you wanna to touch on some of the things that you built into the EV Match platform to mitigate that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we thought a lot about this of how do we balance the need for security, but also this open platform that increases access. And so a few things that we do, one, we provide the address to the driver only after the charging session has been booked and paid for. So that's quite different than PlugShare, where on PlugShare, addresses are just listed and you can see them at any time. With a platform like EV Match, we actually have a gating process where a driver can only see the unique address. Uh, they receive it in an email after they booked a session and access instructions. So there's kind of that separation piece as one, one level of control. Secondly, hosts can choose to have an access control feature um, so they can connect a smart charger to their account as opposed to a non-network charging station. And in those cases, we EV Match actually turns on and off the charging station at the time of the session. So that ensures that a driver can't pull up and plug in and use your charging station um, without you knowing or authorizing it as a host. And then I also want to mention that our hosts are um, required to make their charging stations available in the driveway. So per our terms and conditions, they cannot um, allow access in their garage. So they are not opening up access to their garages with sports equipment, for example. So really they're making a the driveway accessible. That typically means running the charging cable under the garage door or installing the charging station in the driveway. And of course, this is less of a concern with commercial hosting um, where those chargers are located in commercial parking lots. And then lastly, we do monitor our sessions. We are in close communication with our hosts. Um, we always receive feedback through the form of surveys through both hosts and drivers. And if there's bad behavior on the platform, we can certainly remove users from the platform. Great, thank you. Um, 
So uh, I'll just do a shout out here. Someone asked for an EV match referral code. Um, it's actually, we're gonna give you a promo code. Um, it, I, I believe we entered it into the message thread, um, but if you didn't see it, um, you can use charge, C-H-A-R-G-E, underscore up, UP, um, for $10 of EV match charging credit. Charge, underscore up. And that's all caps. Yes, thank you. All right, so another question is, will the user be able to offer free charging through this system? Um, and so the answer is yes, commercial hosts can offer free charging um, currently. Uh, it's not available to residential hosts. Um, so what you can do as a residential host is just pass on the cost of electricity. So don't mark up the, um, the price at all. Um, if you would prefer to you know, keep it as affordable as possible for the drivers. Um, but we do offer the ability to offer free charging um, if you are a commercial host. So let's say you wanna offer free charging to your employees or your customers, um, you can do that through our platform, through that grouping feature that we've mentioned. All right, so uh, another question, how does EVmatch help with demand pricing from electric utilities? Sure, I could take that. Yeah. So, so we've built in um, a pricing calculator for our residential platform that takes into account time of use pricing. So for many utilities, they are moving to residential time of use where the price of electricity fluctuates throughout the day. Um, and so in that case, you might have, for example, 35, 35 cents a kilowatt hour in the middle of the day and then down to maybe 20 cents a kilowatt hour, 18 cents at night. Um, so what we do is the site host will enter in their utility name, for example, um, Pacific Gas and Electric, their rate schedule name, so maybe time of use one, and then we know exactly what your rates are at any point in time that takes into account seasonal variation, weekdays, and the price that's delivered to the driver is actually fluctuates throughout the day depending on the cost of electricity. So in that sense, um, the, the price is really dependent upon the time of the day and the demand. Um, and so as we have, for example, more solar on the grid and we actually have cheaper electricity during the daytime, those prices will start to be reflected to EV drivers. Um, so that's one way we actually take into account time of use pricing. And this is really helpful for hosts who are on TOU rates and they wanna make sure they're not losing money during kind of the middle of the day, those, those peak periods. Um, I'll also mention that we have the ability to do demand response programming. And so later, as we scale this network, we're really excited about the opportunity to take advantage of all these connected devices, all these distributed assets, um, and leverage our platform to have more flexible demand side management. So we can um, actually aggregate all of our hosts and um, provide grid services to utilities, whether that's in the form of demand response where we actually can turn on and off charging stations if hosts uh, allow us to do so, or we can leverage price signals to influence the behavior of EV drivers. So for example, we might um, work with a utility and have really high prices at certain times to dis disincentivize charging or have very low prices at other times, or even pay people not to charge. Those are just some ideas for the future. So I think that the opportunity with peer-to-peer -peer EV charging right now starts with increasing access to charging, but then a phase two is really leveraging that network for um, utility grid services. Great, thanks Heather. All right, so we just have about a minute left, maybe even a little less, so we'll just do one more question. Um, we'll kind of end it on, I'm sure what many, many folks were thinking when they heard that it was a peer-to-peer um, network presentation, they probably thought of Airbnb or Lyft. So these are opportunities to make extra money. Um, so someone asked how much can the average homeowner make um, per month and, uh, and, and sort of what's the rate of attrition, um, you know, how many people are dropping off of your, your platform. Um, so Heather, do you wanna just take that, uh, mention a few numbers and we'll close it out? Yeah. So we, um, on average right now, we're seeing our residential hosts are earning about $15 to $20 per month. Um, and in terms of attrition, it's very low. We, we lose about 5% of our hosts annually. And those are typically hosts who are moving to other locations. That's why they choose to deactivate their EV match listing. Um, I will note that we expect these numbers to increase dramatically as we have more EV drivers. 
um, and as we continue to scale our network. And for our commercial hosts, we um, we noted it was the $1,500 per year um, that those charging hosts are earning per unit. So that's per charging port. Great. All right, with that, um, I wanna thank our presenters. So Vanessa Perkins with Community Charging. Thanks, Vanessa. I don't know if she muted herself. Thanks, everyone. Oh. There we go. <laughs> no thank you. Um, and obviously, thanks, Heather, again, for sharing your wisdom. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for joining us and the engagement today. And uh, so, you know, stay in touch with us. Um, if you have more questions about how you can get involved with peer-to-peer -peer charging and help uh, increase EV adoption, you can email us. Um, both Heather and my email addresses are here on the screen. Um, and you can check us out at evmatch.com as well. Um, if you want to download the app, you can do so, so in either the, uh, from either Google Play or the App Store. And um, again, stay safe, everyone. Um, hopefully, we will see you again on May 26th for our next webinar. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Take care. Stay safe.